Welcome to PK Classics, where we honor our upline so we can inspire our downline. My name is Vance Day, and it's great to be here with you again and with my co-host, Lisa Alexson. So, Lisa, we've reached back into the vault, and we've pulled out one of the longest messages yet. <laughs> so tell us what we're going to see today. It's long, but it's powerful. You're going to want to stay for the whole thing. Joe White is going to present mm. the message of a cross builder. What would it have been like to be an ordinary carpenter the day when Jesus was being nailed to a cross and the, the gospel was being shared and the whole perspective behind that. So, fans, I really think our viewers are going to appreciate I know I did. It's a powerful message. And we've got a special surprise in the middle. We're going to have an interview with Joe. Yep. So stay with us and enjoy. This is the moment to turn the tide. But how? Perhaps there is an example. Centuries ago, society came to a pivotal moment. Like today, mankind had drifted from purpose to self-indulgence. The times were dark, so dark, that God himself intervened. He sent light, light to expel the darkness. He sent love to replace the selfishness. He sent forgiveness to restore relationships. He sent his son. He turned the tide. For one brief instant, together in this arena, we travel back through time for a glimpse of how it might have been. Join one woodworker preparing a rough hewn cross for a falsely accused carpenter. He is creating the tool that God would use to roll back the darkness, to defeat the power of death, to restore life forever. Make another one in a hurry. You gotta have it today, he said. This one goes up with the two thieves from Hebron. Barbarians. Scum of the earth barbarians they are. A life sent us in their smelly dungeons would be better than this torture. I swear by Julius Caesar, there ain't a worse way to die. Well, I've been building these Roman crosses for 20 years. They keep asking for them by the hundreds. I just wonder why this one's got to be taller than the, the rest of the crosses that we built. Jesus, they call this man everything's been different since he stepped into this country two maybe three years back and now they're nailing him to a Roman cross and even this has got to be different claiming to be God he did that's a mouthful you know claiming to be God. We got no God in this country but Tiberius Caesar and everybody but him knows that he's no God. I will never forget the look on my sister's face the day she went to see this man Jesus preach up by the Sea of Tiberias two, maybe three days walk to the north. And I will never forget the, the look in her eyes when she came home from listening to this man teach. You'd have thought she'd seen God. And I will never forget the words that she told me that he spoke said he spoke with a man of authority. He spoke as if he was God. Yeah. 
And I will never forget the words that she said that he spoke. Words that no man speaks. He spoke as words of God. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, he said, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See God? I have not seen God. If there is a God, Blessed are those, he said, who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He will know persecution today, he will. There is no persecution like the Roman cross. He'll understand persecution. Now I'm not a Hebrew, I am not a Jew. But I've watched them. I've watched the Jews. I've watched the Hebrews. And they believe that there is a God. Yes. They believe that there is a God. And they believe Perfect blood must be sacrificed to forgive man's sins, you know, to make one right with God. And every year, every year, the same week, the Hebrews bring their lambs into this city through that gate, into their city and into their temple where their lambs are examined by their high priest. And if that high priest finds the lambs spotless and unblemished, he sacrifices these lambs and they forgive their sins for a whole year, cleansed. This man Jesus, my sister tells me, He claims to be the Lamb of God, the human Lamb of God, sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. Do I believe that? Do I believe that? I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to. Because if it's not true, Roman cross builder, scum of the earth that I am, I suppose I would be headed straight for hell. But if it is true, if it is true, then even I, the lowest man in this culture, have hope. And I will tell you something if you promise not to laugh and don't tell anyone that I said it. But this man, Jesus, He made a claim this week three times that he would actually become alive after this cross, that somehow after three days he would walk again as Lord of life. And I promise you that no one survives the Roman crucifixion, no one. It's painful and it's slow but it is sure death. I've watched him die for decades. According to Roman law, two Roman coroners will sign his death certificate after he dies, and if they're wrong, they will be crucified for their mistakes, so he'll die. And he will be laid in a tomb with the seal of Rome to guarantee the security. Let me tell you, if he's man, he will not come out. But if he is God, If his claims are true, on Friday, on Saturday, and Sunday, 
and you will see a day this world will never forget. If it's not true, he'll be forgotten. You give him a week, a month, maybe at most a year, and you'll never hear his name again. But if it is true, if it is true, you mark my word, history will not be able to contain what happens on this tree. Now, I do not know about you, but I will be around on Sunday morning to see for myself. I am coming back to watch. I'll be around on Sunday. Well, it should have been the end. It happened. After being beaten, after being spit upon, after having a crown of thorns beat into his brow, after receiving the dreaded Roman flogging that literally took the skin off of a man's back, would take a man within an inch of his life, crucified on a 14-foot Roman cross with 12-inch Roman spikes in his hands and his feet, a Roman spear stuck through his side into his lung and into his heart, examined by two coroners, sealed in a Jewish tomb, sealed by the seal of Rome, guarded by a Roman guard, it should have been over. But to the surprise and disappointment of the Sanhedrin, the Romans, and later Voltaire, and Nietzsche, and Darwin, and Marx, and Lenin, and tens of thousands of other critics and cynics, for the next 2,000 years, he's not only not been forgotten, it's the greatest movement that's ever happened in the history of the world among mankind. They couldn't have been further from the truth. And that movement has landed in Nashville, Tennessee tonight. And that movement fills this arena. And it fills your heart with awe and wonder. Yes, he's alive. But the most impressive thing to me is a common man. A man like many of you. A man with torn knees and and torn elbows, a man who's been struggling through life for 52 years as a common man, the thing that gets me on my knees, the thing that deepens my relationship with him the most is not what he did on a sermon on a mount, it's not what he did on a mountaintop, but it's that this man, who his father gave him the commission as CEO of the entire universe, he put all things in subjection under his feet, and yet, knowing all of that, after washing the men's feet who were going to betray him and one who was going to betray him to death, he gave his greatest sermon, men, he's ever given. I love humility. It was humility in its highest form. It was love in its greatest denomination. He gave his greatest sermon, not on the mountaintop, but he gave his greatest sermon with a cross in the middle of his back. It was here that he looked at the men who had abused him. It was here that he looked at the ones who had taken these nails and pounded them into his hands and his feet. It was here that his big father's heart broke for the men and the ladies. And he saw them in their ignorance and he wanted to reach out to them, even there as a father. He broke and he said, Father, forgive these men for they know not what they do. You talk about love, men. And then his, his father's heart broke again as he looks to his left and there is a thief on the cross, a man like me, a man who had fallen and been broken so many times. And this man had brought only one tiny seed of faith. Many of you came to this arena tonight with a small 
almost invisible seed of faith. You've been hurt so bad and broken so many times too. But this thief placed that seed of faith in the heart of the one he thought could save him. And he said, sir, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at that man, and this big daddy heart came out of him. And he reached his heart around this man, and he said, truly I say to you today, you too will be with me in paradise. And then, men, something happened in the history of this world that has never happened, nor will it happen again. As the prophecies of a thousand years in Psalms 22 and of 750 years in, in Isaiah 53 came crashing down on this man's shoulders, he said in Psalms 22, prophetically, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. I cry by day, but thou dost not answer. By night, but I have no rest. I'm being poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My, I have dried up like a pot's herd. My tongue clings to my jaw. Thou hast laid me in the dust of death. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Dogs surround me. A band of evildoers encompass me. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And then Isaiah picks it up 250 years later, and he says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. It pleased the Lord, Isaiah said, to crush him. Galatians picks it up in Galatians 3.13. And it says that this Jesus became a curse. I mean, the first time I heard that, I was an adult. I couldn't believe it was in there. I couldn't believe that that this perfectly pure, wonderful man had become a curse. I couldn't get over it. And I cracked, I cried, and I cried, and I bawled. And, and I hadn't gotten over it to this day that this, that this man, this, this Jesus, the one called Christ, would actually take himself as a curse. That was my sin and your sin, man, that he was cursed with. And he looks up for his daddy, he's all alone, and his holy father does something he'd never done before and will never do again. The father turns his head as Jesus took the blame. And Jesus looks to the back of his father and he says in his heart, Daddy, Daddy, where are you, Daddy? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he had one order of business, one legal order of business men to take care of before he breathed his last. Because there was a legal problem between you and God, a major eternal legal problem. And the problem was your certificate of debt. Everything you've ever thought and said and done that stood against the purity of Christ. Kiss this thing, Pop. stood to condemn you, and I don't know about you, but my certificate of debt is here, and my certificate of debt is long, and it's embarrassing, and it's shameful, and it is my eternal destruction, and Jesus knew that, and he knew that there was only one proclamation that could be made that would save me, and that legal proclamation is spelled out in Colossians in the second chapter in the 14th verse verse where he says, even though you and I were dead in our transgressions and the uncircumcision of our flesh, he has made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven all your transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against you and which was hostile to you, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And so he took the debt and he screamed one legal word, 
which meant paid in full. And the legal word was understood in the Roman language. The legal word was tetelestai. Tetelestai meaning paid, paid in full. And so, As your certificate of debt stood before him, he looked at it, he examined it, and he knew you couldn't pay it. And he took the debt to the Father, and he said, Tetelestai, it's paid in full. And he was the only one in all of eternity who could do it, but he did. And then the Scripture says, he breathed his last. Men, tonight I come to you as a broken man, a common man. I entered my adult life, my professional career, the first day of coaching on a football field at Texas A&M University in spring training, the first day of practice as I was coaching the defensive line there under a dear friend named Gene Stallings. And as I walked out on the field with coach, that night I would go into my bedroom to find the wife of my youth, a young lady I'd been married to throughout my college football career named Cindy, who was a very wonderful woman. And on that night, she told me that she was in love with my best friend and that, that she didn't love me anymore. And they uh, were married, and she left forever. And I was broken, I thought, beyond repair. Some of you have been there before. When your insides die, and you want to die. And for three months, I, I wanted to die. But I found somebody in that valley who was also acquainted with grief, and he was pinned to the same cross that I was pinned to, and he became my friend there. And then for the last 28 and a half years, God gave me a second chance, and he gave me the opportunity to be married to the most wonderful woman on earth, a woman I'm still married to today, and I will die in her arms. Her name's Debbie Jo. And for 28 and a half years, I've sought to serve her and to, to love her as best I could as Christ would love the church. And God gave me the opportunity to have four children and to raise them through some difficult high school years. And they became my best friends, and I love them more than life. And it was summer a year ago, men, when I was training my youngest son for college football. He had asked me to be his trainer, and we'd gone to the football field together for weeks, running sprints to get him ready for his freshman year of college football. And it was like Brian's song. I was Brian Piccolo training Gail Sayers. And so proud of Gail, the young athlete. My boy's name's Cooper. And we would run 40 sprints together and sweat together and fight for the finish line and laugh together and pray together. And on the last day of our training, before he left for college, the doctor came up on the football field and he had uh, looked at a blood test that I had taken because of some bruising that was going on in the back of my legs. And the blood test showed that I had leukemia and that uh, I had to deal with a, uh, what I later found out to be an incurable uh, disease that left a man in a very brutal and painful and bloody death. And I came here tonight to share that with you, to tell you that there's peace in the valley.
We are so grateful to have Joe White with us today, aren't we, Lisa? I mean, the blessing of, of getting Joe and spending some time with him. I just, I just remember Joe as a young man being at Promise Keepers events and seeing you, you know, your message and, and dragging those, those logs. I mean, those things must have been heavy. Would you tell us how that all occurred? What, what was the genesis of you doing all that? Well, we were in uh, Three River Stadium in 1996 doing an event, and um, we had 55,000 men in those days uh, at that event, and I saw a giant cross in the middle of this event, just as a um, what the cross should be, just a pillar of reconciliation, forgiveness, and peace for the men. And, I, and after I came home from the event, I called... Uh, Promise Keepers that time, and I saw the vision, and they didn't see it. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, they called me back a couple of times, and then I think it was 2000, uh, they called me up to Des Moines, Iowa, and we were in an arena with 10,000 guys. And so I just I just went, I'm going to go for it. So I, I called a buddy up there, Gary Rossberg, and so he and his son-in-law cut down this uh, big elm tree, and right out of the woods. And so we took it in and I played the role of a Roman cross builder uh, to build the cross that Jesus would die on, the greatest man who ever lived would die on. And we did this drama and the men, uh, and then I took the cross on my shoulder as if Christ was expressing his drama on the hill so men could see firsthand the passion of the cross. And the men stood up and, and they started cheering for Jesus and the, the emotion and the movement of the spirit. There were 10,000 guys on their feet and they stayed on their feet for like 25 minutes, <laughs> literally uh, cheering everything I'd say. They were just cheering the cross and cheering Jesus. It was the most emotional men's event I ever did. I think I did 84 events in those days for Promise Keepers. And, but but it, the, the Spirit of God was just moving like crazy. And they never sat. And then at the end, I gave them, uh, I had 10,000 chain links indicating that I want to be a bond servant for Jesus. I want to go all out and commit my life for Jesus. And they had to go downstairs, down through an escalator in the basement of this arena to get their uh, chain link. And in about four hours, 10,000 chain links had disappeared. So it, it was just the power of the cross. That's all it was, was the power of the cross. Um, it, was, it was wild and wacky. So we did it for, oh, I don't know, the next five or six years. We had a blast. It was so fun. You know, Joe, one of the things that I appreciate about you and your story is you do an impeccable job of breaking down just the thought process of this cross builder. What would it have been like? What would he have been thinking when Jesus was hanging around in his city? And, and then as you go on to share your story, you're very relatable. I mean, I don't know how many people could lift that tree and carry it in there. Can't relate to that part. And I'm sure a lot of people can't. But your heart and your experiences, you've really told your story and Jesus' story in a way that almost every human being, especially men, can go, I'm, I am like him. That's what I want inside. Huh. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, the Roman cross builder, the old Roman, he, he talks uh, as he builds and he invites men to ask questions and it draws men to the cross. And what God has kind of done with this uh, drama over the year, years, we've done it like 500 times or more around the world, but, uh, but it sort of puts the cross in men's laps. It just kind of becomes a 3D uh, expression of the crucifixion and every man has to deal with it and because the cross builder begins to ask questions it invites men into the conversation and then when that I don't know how many pounds that thing used to weigh it was like hundreds I have no idea but but when Jesus would take it on his shoulder it invited men to Calgary where they had to deal with the incredible suffering and loss of the Savior as he expresses his last words on the cross and his invitation to the thief to come join the family so that every man could see that I am a candidate for salvation. And the invitations in those days were so wild. Thousands of guys would come up to the cross and they would bring their sins on a card. My mommy, age 96, 
before she died, she said, have him nail it to the cross. I'll never forget it when she told me that going into one of the events. And so the men would write all their uh, their burdens and sins and hurts and failures on the cross. And I'm on the cards and we would nail them to the cross, thousands and thousands and thousands of cards to the cross. And uh, oh, salvation was all over the place. It was so fun. Nothing like that, Joe. You think about all those men who saw you go through that process of building the cross and talking to them about it. You know, the, the men that I've talked to, the, the, the PK legacy guys, I mean, they, and I was there at some of those. And so I know how it affected me. But boy, they just, they talk about that experience for them, Joe. We just want to thank you for the legacy that you've placed in the hearts of men. Now, that was 19 years ago that we're watching, of course, you speak in Nashville, 2001. Since then, you know, the world has changed in so many ways. And, I mean, you've changed. You've gone through so many different things. Would you give the audience kind of an update on what's going on with you? And, and, and then let us know what you think men need to hear today as men of God. Well, I had a vision uh, in 2000 of a million men at the cross, and that's where Promise Keepers and I went for the next five or six years. Um, and, you know, by the grace of God, I think, you know, it, it probably happened, or maybe more. I have no idea. But we, in those days, gathered a million men or so uh, at the cross. And it was so great because that year I got leukemia, and it was the Lord setting uh, me up for, you know, uh, failure and suffering. Uh, and then I, I, you know, I had heart attacks and all kind of surgeries. And more recently, uh, my little, my little Olaf here, my cute little, uh, my cute little amputation little leg here. <laughs> but the great thing about just, you know, suffering, uh, and suffering well, which is really what we are to teach our children is to suffer well. But suffering with fun and laughter, even though sometimes you're on the floor weak crying your eyes out in pain. Uh, but it draws men to Jesus' as suffering. So I count, I count all the sufferings in, along the way and cancer, prostate cancer, and all this stuff. Uh, it's just been more and more fun and exciting. And, um, and you know, this, this leg and all the other stuff communicates louder than I can with my voice. Um, so, um, it's, it's all been, honestly, it's all honestly been a blast. I've never had so much fun in my life. I've never been so excited to live. Uh, I've never been more ready to die. And, uh, the ministry continues to men and students, uh, of little Olaf and, uh, and the Roman cross builder. Um, so we're, we're just, we're, we're, we're into the best days of our life right now. Oh, well, we appreciate that, Joe. You know, God takes us all through difficulties, and, and his, the joy that he can place in us, that James chapter 1, verse 2, consider it all joy. You know, we have to understand that in difficult times. And I, I love how our CEO and president of the board, um, Ken Harrison, how he says, I want men around me who, who walk with a limp, men whose humility, their character has been chiseled by difficult times, but they understand that God always shows up. He's never late. And so we're so grateful for the time we've been able to spend with you here, Joe, and we'll continue to pray for you and your Thank ministry. You. Thank you. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to now jump back into uh, Joe's message. And we're so grateful for the legacy that God has given Joe, uh, as well as Promise Keeper. At the last Promise Keepers event, we went to Providence, and on my way to Providence, I was showering the night before I left, and the Lord asked me a question, men. And it was probably the most sobering question I've ever been asked by the Lord. And he said in my heart, he said, Joe, is it worth it if you have to die an early death in order that you would be able to relate with one man in this Colosseum who's either dying of cancer or dying of a cancer of pornography, or a cancer of adultery, or a cancer of bitterness. He said, was it worth it if you could relate to one man 
and your cancer could bring one man to the foot of this cross, would you do it? Is it worth it? And men, I will tell you, I'm passionately in love with my bride, and I love my children, and now my grandchildren, more than I could ever describe to you. I've never had more fun in my life than I'm having at age 52. But he asked me, would it be worth it? Would you give it all that one man would spend eternity with you? And I thought about it for a while as I got out of the shower and I dried myself. I thought and I wondered because I try to be a man of integrity and I didn't want to just say yes, Lord. And I thought that in a trillion years when I was in heaven with you, whoever you are, that somehow I'm able to connect to in your sadness or your brokenness or your desperation where I am. And I said, Lord, absolutely it would be worth it. Absolutely if I could give up 20 or 30 years of my life for a trillion years with a man from Nashville, Tennessee, who didn't know why he came to this conference in the first place. I will tell you, sir, whoever you are, wherever you are, that I can say in this deep, dark valley of the shadow of death, the words of the eloquent African-American pastor, Dr. S.M. Lockridge, a man I would love to meet someday, when he said, and these are my words today, he said, and I can say with cancer and leukemia that my king is a sovereign king. He's a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. That's a mighty king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's my king. And I wonder, do you know him? Well, David said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-reaching telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his magnificent blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? Well... He's the greatest phenomenon to ever cross the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's matchless, and he is unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the miracle of the age. He's he. Yes, he is. He's the superlative of everything good you choose to call him, and he's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. And I wonder, do you know him? Well, he sympathizes and he saves. He supplies strength for the weak. He gives sufficient grace to the tempted and the tired. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leper. He forgives the sinner. He discharges the de debtor. He defends the captive. He blesses the young. He regards the unfortunate. He rewards the aged. He beautifies the meek. Well... My king is the key. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway to deliverance. He's the pathway to peace. He's the roadway to righteousness. He's the highway to holiness. He's the gateway to glory. Well, his office is limitless. His light is matchless. His goodness is everlasting. His love is unchanging. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you today, but I can't. He's in describable. Yes, he is. He's indescribable. He's in Describable. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hands. You can't outthink him. You can't outsmart him. You can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Yes. 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 That's my king. That's my king. That's my king.
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and ever. And when you're through with all the forevers, then amen, amen, my King. You are my King. My God, my God Almighty, you are my King. Amen and amen. Men tonight at the foot of this cross, biblical salvation is going to happen. I'm not talking about rededication, and I'm not talking about Americanized, cheap, grace salvation. I'm talking about salvation that comes from the very lips of Jesus Christ Himself. There may be one man in this arena, and there may be 10,000 who would receive this, the greatest gift any person will ever receive in your life on planet Earth. But when biblical salvation happens to you, I promise you, you will never have to fear the doctor's report, the sentence of death that I received 12 months ago. You will never have to wonder or worry when you read Jesus' words in Revelation in the third chapter in the 15th verse when he says, I wish that you were hot or cold, but that you be lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Men, insincere faith is no faith at all. But when biblical salvation happens to a man, the Holy Spirit seals his heart, Scripture says. And nothing on earth, not the gates of hell, can break that seal and take the Holy Spirit away from you. So many of us in this arena, so many of us honestly, with complete integrity, so many of us in this arena have been to church for years. We've sung the hymns, we've walked the aisle, we've prayed the prayer countless times, we've raised our hands, but the seed of faith has never traveled from our head into our heart. We look in the mirror and we don't see the fruit of godliness in our lives. We don't feel the assurance that faces death with calmness. Our wives and our children don't see the fruit and the reality of Christ in our hearts. The sin that rages in our hearts continues to rage and we feel helpless. But biblical salvation will turn your life upside down and inside out. Biblical salvation will give you eternal life, but men, biblical salvation will cost you everything. So many of us in here tonight are crying for the real thing. After tonight, by the grace of God, you'll never have to cry again. Men, biblical salvation, according to the words of Jesus, means first, a man must repent. It's one of the greatest words in the entire Bible. Repent means in its most vivid form that you would take a piece of paper, and I'm going to ask you to do this tonight, everybody, and you would write down on that card, or maybe you would take page 12, it's a blank page from your Promise Keeper notebook, you would take a pen, and in the mirror of the skin and blood that drapes this cross, you would write down everything in your life that you can think of that stands between you and the purity of Christ. For many of us, it might be pornography. It might be what Christ called in Matthew 5, mental adultery. For many of us, it would be lust for another woman. Or maybe it would be adultery. Perhaps it's drugs. Perhaps it's alcohol. Perhaps it's rage. Perhaps some of you, like me, have a bitterness in your heart towards a spouse or an ex-spouse, perhaps. Or maybe, men, it was your father. So many men I find as I counsel are bitter towards their fathers because they never met the expectations you had as a young boy. And the bitterness is there and it comes out in your marriage and it comes out when you discipline your children and you wonder why. It's because you're bitter. I ask you to write the bitterness on that card. Whatever it is that blocks the seed of faith from traveling from your head down into your heart where salvation happens, sin does that. Write it down, men. Write it down. Write all of it down on the piece of paper. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you to bring that piece of paper to this platform where we will take your papers and your certificate of debt with mine and we'll nail it to that cross where Scripture says it will be forgotten and forgiven and forgotten because here at the cross, we will ask God to fill our hearts with His Holy Spirit. And it is the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit that gives the man the ability to turn 180 degrees and to walk from those sins, never to return to those sins again. Do you need that? Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, in the 15th verse, the time is fulfilled. And I'll look at the powder keg of Israel today on the headlines of every newspaper in the, 
in the world, and I'll tell you, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. So the second thing you must do for biblical salvation is belief. And men, I will promise you, salvation belief is not a cheap, costless acknowledgement of what he did for you on that cross. Any fool can see that. Salvation belief, according to Scripture, is a faith so strong that you are willing to lay down your habits, your idols, your past, your finances, your relationships, even if your life, if necessary, to say, Jesus, I will follow you and you alone. Biblical salvation faith is full committal. Salvation belief, men, is a change of conduct. Salvation belief is a commitment to walk in the footsteps of the one who saved you. Biblical belief to salvation is best described. I've never heard it like this before in my life. My son told me this recently. By a young Zimbabwe African pastor who carved in the door of his humble abode in which he was martyred brutally for his faith. Before he was martyred, he carved his proclamation of belief in the door. Here's what he said. He said, I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I've stepped across the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I will not look back, let up, back up, slow down, or be still. I am done. I am finished with sight walking, smooth living, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly chatter, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, applause, or popularity. I do not have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his power, walk in his presence, and labor in his power. My face is set. My gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, my vision is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, turned back, lured away, deluded or delayed. I will no longer flinch in the face of persecution, hesitate in the presence of my enemies, pander in the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I will not give up, let up, shut up until I've stayed up, stored up, paid up, prayed up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes, give until I drop, preach until I know, work until he stops me, and he, when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner is clear. I'm completely his. Men, biblical salvation will not make you a religious Christian. Biblical salvation will make you a disciple of Jesus. And then, and then you must receive the Holy Spirit into your heart. My friend Marvin Delf told me that there's 18 inches between heaven and hell, and that's the distance between your head and your heart. Jesus is not a file. Unfortunately, a good share of American evangelism teaches and allows us to believe that Jesus can go into a file that goes into the filing cabinet and opens up every Sunday morning or sometime when you're in a crisis. Salvation isn't a file. Salvation is when the Holy Spirit comes in and takes over your heart. The Greeks called your heart your cardia, C-A-R-D-I-A, your cardia, the volitional center where life makes up its mind. Your heart, men, is mission control for everything you think, say, and do. If God is your co-pilot, move over. He's not in your heart, he's in your head. Jesus said in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. And finally, when biblical salvation takes place permanently in a man, a man commits himself to follow Christ. The apostle Paul and Peter understood this better than anyone. These two writers of the New Testament saw a different Jesus. They saw a Jesus who was not nailed to a cross. They saw a Jesus who was chained out of love to a cross. They knew no Roman nail could hang God on a cross. They saw a man who loved you so much that he chained himself unto death. And Peter said, walk as free men, but do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but as a bond slave of God. Men, a bond slave is a man who loves his master so much that he chains his heart even though he's free. He changes his heart to his master for life. Paul said, I will die in my chains. I'm a bondservant, a bondservant of Christ forever. A man who's a follower of Jesus who's been biblically saved is chained to Christ and proud of his chains. 
Men, there's only one chain on a man's heart, and that chain will either chain you to your past, or it will chain you to a habit, or it will chain you to Christ. Tonight, I invite you to come forward and to take on the chains of Christ. Jesus calls men to be players. Tonight, I ask you to come down to this floor at the base of this cross and become a player. Jesus does not want spectators. He wants players. When you're biblically saved, you don't just show up. You come to play. I invite you. If this is the salvation that you crave, I invite you, wherever you are in this arena, to get up out of your seat with everything you can think of that stands against Christ, the sins in your lives written down privately and then fold it over, your certificate of debt, and I invite you to bring it forward and put it on this platform or perhaps pass it forward to this platform where we will nail it there. And the Bible says that God forgets it. And we'll ask the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and to give us the power to walk away from those sins forever. We're asking tonight for you to come to this cross and to have a night with God that eternity will never forget. Wherever you're seated, I ask you to come. Come to this cross if you desire that salvation. Please come. promise keepers of the friendships, the men who bring men who've been praying for each other for weeks, and some of you neighbors and people in the church you've been praying for for years. I'm going to ask everyone in this arena, everyone, every single person seated, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to look to your left and to your right and ask the man out loud these two things. Please don't let this pass. Ask the man to your left and your right, and then they will ask you. If you have a desire in your heart to go down there, I'll go with you. If you're up in the top, it takes about three to five minutes to find an island to come down. Ask the person on your left and your right. We'll be here for 10 or 15 minutes, plenty of time. If you'd like to go down there, I'll go with you. If there's something in your heart you want to get on paper and get on this altar and to bring it before the throne of Christ, say, if you want to go down there, I'll go with you. And then pick that man uh, arm in arm and shoulder to shoulder and come down with him. Please come, if that's your desire. 
Joe White to Nashville 2001, Vance, mm. though it was 19 years ago, that was powerful. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I remember not being at Nashville, but being at one of those and the impact that it had upon me. And so many of our men, Lisa, they, they talk about Joe's impact upon them. And he's so energetic. Mm -hmm. I love that. And about strong. Him. And strong. Yeah, I mean, to lift that kind of stuff. Oh, my gosh. Well, we have so enjoyed our time with you today. And we're looking forward to being with you again. You know, it's so important that we revisit these messages because they're so desperately needed today. So until next week, when we get together, we'll be praying for you. We'll be thinking of you. And please, you know, gather your friends together. Join the show as we enjoy what God is doing in the hearts of men today. So on behalf of PK Classics, we thank you. We'll see you again soon. him of confession and brokenness and cry to him for forgiveness and for victory. So that from Alaska to Florida, your will, not our will, as it is done in heaven. So that people see not us, but they see Christ in our actions. We're going to start to lift up our pastors. We're going to start to stand in the gap for our preacher. We're going to pray around the clock. We're going to build these men up. We need great leadership. Let's rally them. Let's ignite them. We can change the spirit of this nation. We must represent together a new spirit for the world. You have been called from being a slave to the devil to being a slave of Jesus Christ. We are somebody because we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a child of the King. I am now a member of the family of God. greatest thing that can happen is for Christians to rise up and take this country for Christ.